welcome again to Grace Baptist Church in Perth um, in these extraordinary times. We're glad you're with us. We thank you for joining us on this Wednesday evening. Um, on Sunday past, we started a new series on the Book of Haggai, and we're going to continue that on this evening. Um, and then on Sunday uh, of this week coming, we will continue then back to our original series, which was the Book of, uh, of Philippians, and we'll continue on with that particular series. And now hopefully, we've had a few technical difficulties up until this particular point, um, so hopefully you've had a little bit of a music interlude at the beginning there, um, a particular hymn that we chose for this evening, and hopefully you were able to join in and enjoyed that. On a Wednesday evening, we're hoping to do something like that, slightly different to the Sunday. On a Sunday, we are live streaming on Facebook, um, and it's just really the preaching of God's Word. But on a Wednesday, uh, with a bit of trial and a bit of error, no doubt, we're going to try and have a, a complete service, as it were, with some worship items at the beginning and a worship item at the end, but always central around God's Word. And that's what we intend to do at these times uh, when we're on live. Obviously, we yearn for the day when we're all back together again, uh, worshipping again in, in a building. And we know that the church isn't a building. We, we understand that. but uh, And we understand that we, uh, as individual believers, are the building. We are, we are the building. Of, we are the church. So we would just um, pray for that day when we come back together um, and to be able to worship God uh, as a body. Uh, wherever that may be. Um, as I said, we've hopefully um, you've enjoyed that wee item of song at the beginning, but now we're going to start um, before we come to God's Word and we're going to pray. Um, we're going to come before the Lord and ask for His help at this time. So if we can bow our heads and come before the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, again, we just give you praise and we give you thanks that we're able to be here uh, this evening we're able to join together over the airways to to praise and to worship you heavenly father we we come humbly before you because of who you are you are a thrice holy god but lord also we come boldly before you again because of who you are you're our heavenly father so lord we come with humility of heart and, and boldness of mind, Lord, as we come before you to praise and to worship you, to, to send up our supplications to you, Heavenly Father, because of who you are. You are God, and we thank you for that. And Heavenly Father, as we come round your word this evening, we would ask for your help. We would ask that the Spirit of God would be in the midst of us. Heavenly Father, wherever that may be, in our living rooms, in our kitchen, in our bedrooms, wherever it may be, and wherever we're listening or watching this, Lord, we would just ask that the presence of God would be there to help us as we listen to God's word being preached. Help me this evening, Lord, as I preach your word. And help each and everybody who, who is listening. Lord, take the distractions away. There are so many at this time that we, our, our mind is full of things that could possibly make us wander away from your word and, and wander away from focusing on you. So, Lord, we would ask that you will take those things from us. Turn the television off, Lord. Turn the, 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 the phone off, Heavenly Father, the ringer off. So, the Lord, we all we are doing is focusing upon our Saviour. That is our prayer this evening. And, Heavenly Father, we would just ask that for other places, other churches who are faithful to your word, faithful to the blood of Christ, who preach uh, faithfully each and every week if they're doing something similar lord again we would just pray that your presence would be with them with them now that you would help them even at this time and lord that the gospel the good news of christ will go forth into all the corners of this earth even this evening that people will hear the good news and heavenly fathers we come round your word this evening lord we would just ask that you would help us to consider our ways if we're saved lord to consider our ways if we're unsaved, if we're far from Christ, Lord, that those who are like that will consider their ways. That is our prayer tonight. And Heavenly Father, we pray that everything that we do, everything that we say, will glorify you and you alone. Amen. Amen. As I said, we're going to continue on with our, our series in the book of Haggai. And we're going to look at chapter 1 again. We looked at chapter 1 on Sunday uh, morning. And we're going to look at the same 11 verses. The first 11 verses in the book of Haggai. So Haggai, the third last book in the Old Testament. Um, and if you have your Bibles, if you would open there and we can read along together uh, God's infallible word. So Haggai chapter one and verse one. 
In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheetiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does, does so to put them in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build a house that I may take pleasure in it, that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land, on the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labours. Amen. We'll end the reading of God's word uh, just there. As I said, we started on Sunday past in the book of Haggai and we looked at the excuses that the people, the Jewish people, made for not building what they were commanded to build, the temple of God. And this evening we're going to go straight into the, the portion of scripture and I want to look at three points this evening if we can. God's command, God's requirement and God's discipline. So God's command, his requirement and his discipline. So the first of these, God's command. And I want you to notice something. It's just that. A commandment from God. It doesn't come from Haggai. This is the word of God to the people. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came by the hand of a Haggai. Verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts. Verse 3, then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Verse 5, thus says the Lord of hosts. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts. Now, yes, of course, we see and understand that the words are coming out of Haggai's mouth. But it is God that is speaking at this point. And he has heard the, the excuses of the nation, of the Jewish people, as why the temple has not been built. And maybe just here we need to realize something. The temple not being built isn't the main problem. It is a problem, of course it is, but it's not the main problem here, I believe. The main problem is people's attitude, their lack of obedience to God, what he's called them to do, their selfish, self-serving mindset that they have at this particular moment in time, their total lack of, of seeking to glorify God. It's their belief that, you know what, this can wait. We can leave this on the back burner, burner at the moment. That's for another time. Building God's temple is for another time. Glorifying God is for another time. We have many other issues that we have to busy ourselves with, to occupy ourselves with. Let's sort out all those things first. And then maybe when things are going okay, when things are going right for us, then we'll look at this temple thing once again. But God says, verse 5, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. It goes on again and says the same thing in verse 7. Consider your ways. And if, I, if my sermon tonight was to have a title, it would be exactly that. Consider your ways. And when God says these words, consider your ways to the nation, it's like so many of God's word in scripture. It's not just an option. He's not saying to the nation here, whenever this suits you, consider your ways. Whenever the time is right, consider your ways. No, this is a command of God. He's telling the Jewish people, 
to do just that. Consider your ways. Let's look at this phrase for a moment. He's literally saying, God is literally saying here, I want you to scrutinize your ways. The path that you're on, you need to seriously consider what you're doing. Ponder, give thought to your ways. The path that you were on before, you've now wandered from it. You've gone astray. And if you continue on this path that you're going on, then great danger will come upon you. Proverbs 14, 12, which we all very, we're all very familiar with. There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is a way to death, a path to death. And, and, and this path that the nation are, that are on is a one that is leading to death because of their disobedience. Remember what their response was? That the time wasn't right to build? The path that they're on is one of self-interest. That's the path that they're on at the moment. And what we learn from this is that their interests are far more important than God's. Their comfort is far more important than God's commands. Their security is far more important than worshipping God. And just like the Jews here, and this is something that we can all struggle with, our priorities sometimes trump God, don't they? So I don't think we can or, or should do really point the finger at the Jewish nation at this point. So often the reasoning behind this mindset, this selfish, disobedient mindset is, and it's quite simple. If we act like this, if we are disobedient, it actually makes our lives slightly simpler, easier, less fraught, less burdened. If we're on this path, it makes just life so much more acceptable to us. But you know, even today we need to consider the path that we are on and return to the one that God has commanded us to be on. That's the path of obedience. And when we are obedient, we will be blessed. I'm not saying that we're going to have everything running smoothly and everything will be per perfect and hunky-dory in our lives. Of course, I'm not saying that. that. Sometimes that happens, but I'm not saying that here. But, you know, we will be blessed because we're obedient to God. And the Jewish na nation here knows this. They know that if they're obedient to God, that they will be blessed. Deuteronomy 28 makes that clear to God's people. And God's people would have known this. Joshua, the high priest, would have known this. They'd have read this before, the results of obedience and the results of disobedience. Deuteronomy reads like this, the first, excuse me, the first few verses. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall be you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle. The increase of your herds and the, the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when, when you go out. And the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command a blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land and the Lord your God that the Lord your God has given you. And it goes on or with that there. So the Jewish nation, the, the Jews that Haggai is speaking to at this point, knew this. They knew if they obeyed God in their lives, and that means faithfully obey God, not just on a whim, not just when the circumstances dictated it and life was easier for them to do it, but in all aspects of their life, in the everyday comings and goings of their life, there would be a personal blessing if they obeyed God. There would be material blessings if they obeyed God. 
if they didn't, the remaining verses of chapter 8 or 28 again make it very clear. Verse 15, but if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I have commanded you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your grounds, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. And surprise, surprise, that's the result of the nation's disobedience, isn't it? Exactly what Deuteronomy tells us it will be. It happens. Verse 6 of Haggai. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put into a bag of holes. At the very least implying, but I believe scripture is showing us, that their disobedience is directly linked with them. With them having poor harvests. With them having poor health. The houses that they dwell, dwell in, the houses that they have pre prioritised are, 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 are worthy to be lived in. But their earthly body, their earthly frame needs serious attention because of their disobedience. And something else about this phrase, consider your ways. The word your. This is a personal command. So often we can look at others and think, well, they need to sort that out in their lives. And if they don't, then the Lord's not going to use them. The Lord's not going to bless them. We look at others and say, wow, how do they expect to be blessed acting like that, speaking like that, carrying on like that? When all along, we really need to be looking in the mirror of Scripture to look at ourselves, don't we? Too often we want to help others and say, right, let me take this speck out of your eye, brother. Let me take this speck out of your eye, sister. And yet there's a plank in our own eye. In some cases, our whole lumber yard is lodged in our eyes. And of course, that reminds us of the portion of scripture on this Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapter 7. So often what we do is we go like this to our brothers and sisters. Look, this is what you should be doing. This is what you should be doing. When what we should be doing ourselves is doing this. Taking that plank out of our own eyes. But here the people are personally reminded you're in this position because of your actions. You've forgotten God's word. You've been disobedient to God and God's word. And you can't look to others now to blame for the position you find yourselves in. It's all down to you and your actions. But it's in our nature, isn't it? Everybody's nature. We constantly look to blame someone else. For the circumstances, if they're bad circumstances, that we find ourselves in. It's not my fault. It's never my fault, is it? It's always someone else's. You know, it quite possibly was my family's fault that I find myself in this. It's quite possibly that it's the government's fault that I find myself in this situation. And then if those excuses don't cut it, people bring out the ace in the pack, as it were. It's God's fault. It's God's fault. But God is speaking plainly here when he says, consider your ways. The second point this evening is God's requirement. God's requirement. And we see that in verses 7 and 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hill and bring the wood and build a house that I may take pleasure in it. That I may be glorified, says the Lord. God again here says, consider your ways. But he, here he's saying, okay, it's time to change. Time to get back on the original path. Look what has happened when you've been on the path of disobedience. The futility of life. The hardship of life. The way you've acted has led to your current position. But now here's another chance 
to consider your ways. What a gracious God. And how often we see that in scripture, isn't it true? What a gracious God we have and, ha and we serve. Samson, when he prays in the book of Judges, he calls out to the Lord and says, Oh Lord God, please remember me and strengthen me only this once. He's saying, Lord, give me the strength once more. Give me a second chance to have the strength that I had once before. Give me the chance to take vengeance on my enemies upon your enemies. Give me a second chance, Lord. Peter, after he denied Christ three times, three times, even after that, God greatly used Peter. And then Jonah, who we've been looking at our own church recently, in chapter three, after he had called out to God from the belly of the fish in chapter two, in chapter three, we read these first, in first um, verse, these words. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the second time the second time a god of second chances now because we have a god of second chances that does not give us the excuse to sin but it shows you what a gracious long suffering suffering and merciful god that we serve and here in haggai we see god give his people another opportunity to confess their sin to confess their disobedience and their covetedness to obey God he's given them another chance to obey God you know here they are to reflect and deliberate on the past and by doing that their future behavior should be changed and only by doing this would their situation change and what does God require them to do? He tells them, build, build my temple. I have told you before, now go and build my temple. Go and get the material that is needed to build it. Go up to the mountain and get the timber. Possibly that was from the king's forest, which we read of in chapter eight, I think, or chapter two of Nehemiah. Find the material there and build. No waiting about. Just get on with it. No excuses this time. I've heard all your excuses. No more excuses. Get the timber, get the material and build my house. And we see why. Because when they do that, God will take pleasure in it. He will be glorified. Not the Jewish people because they've done this wonderful work. No, that God will take pleasure in it and God will be glorified because of this. And God will accept their work. He will accept their sacrifices. And only by obeying God's requirements would they glorify God and we are the same this evening we are the exact same we will glorify God when we are obedient to his commands when we as individuals or we as a church collectively we finish the work that God has called us to do whatever that may be but you know we must make sure the work that we are doing is a work that we have been called to do not something that benefits us personally, building our own houses, as it were. We're not to be consumed by things that build our kingdom. And unfortunately, many fall into that trap today by putting their own self-interest first. Just like the people here. God isn't first. It's their own priorities that are first on the list, top of the list. And, you know, when people do that, when we do that, when the Jewish people did that, so often we don't realise that we're missing out on God's blessing. We suffer because of our disobedience to God's word. And we never we will never have a life that is abundant in blessing. A life that is full a life that is prosperous, prosperous in Christ. And so often many are like that. They build a, a ministry around themselves, not around Christ. They glorify themselves, not Christ. They exalt themselves, not Christ. And that leads us on to our third point, God's discipline. Look at verse 9 to 11 again with me. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. 
And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself on his own house. Now again, before we go any further, did you see that? Did you see that in those last couple of lines? Again, it is personal. Each of you, his own house. We cannot get away from this fact. That we have to look inward. We have to be honest here with ourselves and examine our own heart and our own motives at this point. It goes on to say in verse 10, Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and on the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and all their labours. In verse 9 there we see that God asks a question and then he answers it. Why did I discipline you? Because my house lies in ruins. No beating about the bush here. You're in this situation because the temple, my dwelling place here on earth, the place where you can come and sacrifice, the place where you can come and worship me, where you have to worship me is desolate. It's not fit for purpose. The people thought here that they could get away with this and, and they would prosper. They thought that the work that they did or, or the planting that they did, they thought that it was going to bring forth many crops, bring forth bountiful crops. Enough to, to sustain them, plentiful enough to feed them. But God says no. My house lies in ruins. You know, sometimes I look at this passage, or I have done in the last week, and, and, and think, how come they didn't figure this out? How come the Jewish people couldn't figure this out? After year after year after year, the crops failed. And surely the question was asked, well, why is this happening? Now, yes, there's a drought. Of course, we can see that. But I'm hoping that some and hopefully Joshua the high priest would be among them. I'm hoping some of them are asking the question, why is God letting this happen? Maybe they're, they're saying, you know, we are his people. Why is he letting this happen? We are his chosen people. Why is God letting this happen to us? He sustained us before. He's met our needs before. He's provided for us before. We don't deserve this. Maybe some are thinking, you know, coming back to the land, then that would end the discipline that they're under. Thinking that the hardships that they, they found themselves in exile are far behind them now. Maybe some of them are thinking like that there. This is going to be a bright and new beginning for them. But God says, no. My house is in ruins. And let's be plain here. If God brings about hardship it is God who does it Isaiah 46 and 10 says these words declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose verse 11 calling a bird of prey from the east uh, the man of my counsel from a far country I have spoken and I will bring it to pass I have purposed and I will do it so often, we don't like to attribute things that we think are unholy to a holy God. But God is the centre of all things. He's in control of all things. So when this calamity comes on this nation, when their crops fail, when there's drought, God's in the midst of it. He says that to us. And so often, circumstances change and we look to think, blame this one, blame that one. But it is God in the midst of it. He is in control. We may not understand how he is controlling it, but he is in control. And here we see God's judgment on his people. You know, and he does this to safeguard and defend his holy name. Can you imagine if a visitor came into your church, where you, a place where you worship today, and as they come in, the front door's hanging off its hinges. The windows inside are all blo broken. There's a wind howling through them. The slates are missing 
on the roof. There's a hole, a glaring big hole in the roof where the rain comes in. There's rising damp up the walls because of that rain that pours in. The chairs or the pews that are broken. You can't even sit in them safely. The hymn books, half the hymns are missing. They're grubby, they're dirty. There's no music, or if there is music, it's actually out of tune because you haven't had the piano tuned in years. Now, before you message me, I, I know we as believers are the church. But, and I know that the picture I've just painted there is unlikely in the UK. But if it was, if that was real, would that glorify God? Of course not. Of course it wouldn't. It would show our attitude towards God. Because let me tell you, you wouldn't let your own house fall into that kind of disrepair, would you? And yet metaphorically speaking here, many of our churches are like that today. Just the same as the temple in Haggai's time as well. Dishonouring to God. Because we put ourselves above God. Because the actions and the programmes we put into place are about us. They're not about God and glorifying him. So in conclusion. I would ask you this evening to consider your ways. If you're saved tonight. What are you building for the Lord? Because, let me tell you, we're all builders. What has God called you to build? Build A godly family? Build. A godly reputation in business? We'll build it. A godly witness for the Lord? Build it. Has he served you? or Has he called you to, to serve the local church? Serve it. You know, and when we do these things, and we do them with an absence of self to the fore, we glorify God. Isn't that wonderful? When we're called to obedience, and we do things that God has called us to do, we glorify God. If you're unsafe tonight, again, I would ask you to consider your ways. I don't mean that you, how many more boxes you need to tick. I mean in the midst of all that's going around about in this world right now, uh, the, the world that is full of fear, consider what your hope lies in. Is it material things that are you have around about you? Is it your health? Is that what your hope is in? Is your hope in your family, your wife, your kids, your husband? Is your hope found in your career? Is your hope found in attending church? Is your hope found in giving money to the church? Is your hope found in being a member of the church? If your hope lies in these things, all or even just one of these things, then my friend, you have no hope for tomorrow. Your only hope is and must be found in Christ and Christ alone. Upon his finished work, upon the cross, that he died for you. Because if you do not turn from your sins. And if you do not turn to Christ. Then all hope is lost. For you. I ask you this evening. If you're not saved. To consider your ways. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father. We just again give you thanks. Uh, for help this evening. In these unusual circumstances. Heavenly Father we thank you that we've been able to share your word over the airwaves. And we thank you Lord that we have the technology to do that. And Heavenly Father we live in a world that seems to be hoarding food. And, and stockpiling food and getting ready for whatever. But Heavenly Father we know that people today really need to feed upon the word of God. So Heavenly Father we would ask that even in the coming weeks, that you will give us opportunities to delve into your word. Oh, Heavenly Father, we need a higher view of Scripture. 
Heavenly Father, we need to know that these are your words. And we are to obey your words, your commands, Lord. If we obey your commands, we will glorify you. It's not about us, Lord. It's not about us accumulating stuff. Lord, when we obey your word, we glorify you. Help us to do that, Lord, even this evening. And Heavenly Father, as well as having a high view of the word of God, we would want a higher view of you. Heavenly Father, so often we try and pull you down to our level to make you in our image. But Heavenly Father, we know that is so, so wrong. Help us to have a right view of God. Give us a fresh vision of God, of who you are, your holiness, your justice, all your righteousness, your love. Heavenly Father, we just pray that your word will go forward. And Heavenly Father, it will accomplish what you have set it to do. We ask these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. Now, as I said at the beginning, hopefully um, now we're going to have another item of song if everything has went well. And uh, hopefully you will join that. We we're again will be broadcasting on Sunday at 11 o'clock on Facebook. And we'll be looking at the, the book of Philippians, as I said. So uh, it'd be great to have you with us again on Sunday. Uh, but most of all, uh, if you can join somewhere where there is a Bible believing church, where God's word is faithfully preached. And that you will be edified and encouraged. Uh, thank you again. God bless.